We are live. Well, happy heresies and welcome to the desert of the real. Welcome everyone to Heretics Anonymous. The vid Whoa, I got to mute my own video that's coming out. That always happens, but this is Heretics Anonymous. My name is Miguel Connor and I am a heretic, not a recovering heretic. I guess you could say I'm a recovering orthodox and uh, with us today, we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by Darren Lorente Bull. Darren, eres un hereje? Soy un hereje de vez en cuando. De vez en cuando. Bueno, mucho gusto. Great talking to you again. Thank Thanks you for much. coming Thank back you. on. And uh, we'll definitely be talking about your new book, The Other Brotherhood, When Freemasonry Crossed the English Channel. And with us, too, we've got the Moondog and the Abraxas Chicken Wingman. How are you doing there, Vance, with the with the great eye behind you? Oh, I'm uh, just fine. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning all the dark secrets of masonry. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably be yeah, yeah. Well, we do have we do have a great gang here, and who knows their stuff, their heretical stuff. So, and that includes uh, Nate. How are you doing, Nate? How are your uh, How are you and your plans of world domination going? uh so far so good you'll find out if things go awry all right good 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 keep that illuminati vibe going so very cool well great to have you and uh, great to see there's audience already piling in in the comments section of youtube we will be taking questions if we can so if you have any questions vance will uh prune them out and hand them over to darren or whoever you want to ask questions um so tell us, Darren, uh, tell us about a little bit about yourself and uh, what made you to write your book. Uh, we, on, we had the honor of coming back about a year ago or your first time a year ago to discuss your first book. Uh, what made you write this one? Um, well, I, I, um, I wanted to follow up a bit on, on the, on the um, previous book, More Light, which I wrote with um, Julian Rees. And it was basically introducing the subject of liberal or adogmatic Freemasonry to the um, English speaking um, readership. I think that in English-speaking countries, the um, Freemasonry is um, the, the image that most people have of Freemasonry is what's called regular or mainstream uh, Freemasonry, uh, male-only orders. Um, but there is, of course, uh, a completely different uh, branch or family of the Masonic um, of Freemasonry, which you can find in uh, mainly continental Europe, South America, but of course has a presence as well in many um, English-speaking countries. So. I wanted to introduce um, the, the topic in a bit more depth to um, uh, Masons and non-Masons alike. Well, then tell us a little bit about what uh, Le Droit Humain is, the, the branch that you practice. Did you start out with that or were you more, I think you said you were more a traditional Freemason, right? Yes, yes. I was initiated in 2006 in a traditional um, UGLE Lodge, uh, United Grand Lodge of England Lodge um, in London. Uh, I spent nearly 10 years there, I was very happy, I met some great people. Uh, I ended up resigning and um, in 2016 I joined the British Federation of Le Drac Humain, which is an exponent of liberal or automatic Freemasonry and it's a, a mixed gender Masonic order. Um, Le Drac Humain was, was founded in uh, France uh, the, um, in, in the late 19th century, 1893, as, as a succession of splits from ultimately the um, Grand Orient of France, which is the main Masonic or the largest Masonic order in, in France. And it was founded by um, French Senator George Martin and um, social activist Maria de Rheim. And the main purpose of that order, founding the order, was to um, initiate women in a in a sort of um, open and official way, and that's that's what really defines or makes um, Le Drac Humain distinct is the fact that it's um, it was it was set up for um, uh, you know initiating women alongside men on on an equal footing. Footing. All right, and would you say also with the founding, you say it's a it's a Martinist beginning, but uh, as I read in your book, didn't uh, isn't there some theosophy in there? Was an Annie Besant uh, part of the movement too? Yes, in France, it was very much um, linked to proto-socialist ideals of the late nineteenth century. Mm. Both George Martin and Marie de Rheim were very much into um, you know social rights, uh, uh, equality, uh, secularism, or laicite there. And, and so on and so forth. Um, but when it was transplanted to England at the beginning of the 20th century by Annie Besant and other theosophists, 
it had that flavor of theosophy. So the social aspect was not, was never important, although Annie Besant and most of her contemporaries were very much involved in social courses and, and, and fighting injustice and so on. But the order itself was designed as with a spiritual and um, esoteric emphasis. And of course, I think it's, you know, derived from that, uh, from the philosophical leanings of those original founders here in the UK. Wonderful. Yeah, that Annie Besant, she was a firecracker. I believe she started out as an atheist, and then once she started getting into the esoterica, and then she became an activist, and God, she had her hand in everything. Independence Absolutely. India, I mean, that yeah. woman was <laughs> everywhere in that, part, in that part of the time. There was nothing she had her hands on. And as a La Droid Humane grew, how, how was it welcomed by traditional Freemasonry, or how has been the evolution of these both movements? Friendly, parallel, or... Uh, what do you think, Darren? Well, on, I think on an, on an individual basis, I have many, many friends who are regular Freemasons that belong to uh, regular Masonic orders. And of course, we our friendship remains and they um, we, we, we recognize each other as Freemasons. Um, although we might not obviously visit each other's lodges because we can't, but um, but but we will, uh, you know, friendship and, and um, the fraternal values of being a Freemason remain. But I think that the Masonic establishment um, in England, at least, in, in the, and I think probably in the States, Nate will probably know that better than me, but I think that in, in, in English speaking countries, anything that doesn't abide by the principles of uh, Masonic regularity, i.e. men only, belief in a supreme being, um, only one Masonic jurisdiction per territory, um, and so on and so forth, that the, 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 um, the so-called um, Anderson landmarks, um, it's not it's not considered Freemasonry, so you know you're just immediately not uh, th th we don't exist as far as they're concerned. However, if you go to Spain or to France, there is a bit more of a because the the numbers aren't that um, you know the, the the main for example in in France the main ex the, the the largest Masonic obedience is a liberal one, the Grand Orient of France. So there are th th there's a different relationship, and I think they do recognize each other, although they still can't visit them. It's a bit like um, you know. Um, Anglicans can't have the Eucharist in a Catholic church and vice versa. I mean, unfortunately, it's a, it's a bad analogy, but I think it's the best one I can think of to, you know, that, that we're not in communion with each other sort of thing, you know, it's a bit, which is a bit sad because we are, you know, I think the values we uphold are all, you know, pretty much the same. And we all go through the same rituals. We do all the same, the same work and we have the same aspirations. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and uh, you say liberal Freemasonry is what uh, would would Ladroid Humane be liberal Freemasonry? Again, we're trying to I'm trying to get the distinctions here, especially yes. for the audience that might not be that familiar with all these different nuances. Just like most people might not of know course. the nuances between a Greek Orthodox and a Catholic. There's these little rules that change everything. Yeah, and then you've got the Eastern Catholic churches, but anyway. Of course, yeah. and the Byzantine <laughs> yeah, and the Vietnamese Catholic church, it just never ends. And uh, I mean, you say, are you are you Catholic? And if you are, I'm, are you I'm a Roman Catholic, yes. So you are, can be Catholic and part of La Droid Humane. And well, uh, the, the, uh, the church, I know they frown we, upon Freemasons. I think if my if, if my parish priest is this, maybe not. Maybe you, you finished my um, career in the um, Catholic church. Mm -hmm. I might not be welcome next Sunday. After they watch this, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, yes, of course that we are. You know, if you go by the book, we're forbidden by join. You know, we are forbidden to join um, a, a, any Masonic order, unfortunately. Which I think is uh, personally, I you know, and, I, and obviously I'm not no theologian, but I think it's um, misguided um, notion of what Freemasonry is. Uh, but liberal Freemasonry is, and it's not. This is not to be understood in a political sense. It just means that. Um, we have been liberal with some of the um, landmarks. The, the landmark, what, what makes um, Freemasonry regular, the, you know, the mainstream Freemasonry, men only, is the belief in the supreme being, only men are accepted, um, only one Masonic jurisdiction per country, um, no discussion of political or uh, religious topics within a Masonic context. Those are the, you know, grosso modo, those are the, the main... Um, mm -hmm principles for regularity so liberal freemasonry some some orders have um you know initiated women so obviously they've they've broken some of those rules others um will don't um require belief in a supreme being others don't um, others discuss political topics i mean i particularly don't i i'm quite um 
against the last one, if you ask me as on a personal level, but um, that's what it is. It's a liberal interpretation of the um, principles of regularity. I think that's that, that's what makes it liberal, liberal or adogmatic. So, you know, it's not to be understood in political terms. Yeah, we have a relevant question from the, uh, the, sure. watch, uh, the listeners, watchers, I mean. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, one watcher says, viewer. That's it, the word's viewer. Yes. Um, <laughs> why are there so many Masons in churches, but they don't say anything? They just kind of hide there, and they're Masons. He says Christianity is masonry light, Freemasonry light. I'm not sure how that relates, but he says so many of them are in churches, but they don't try to show fundamentalists that literacy uh, interpretations are uh, psycho he says oh so so what 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 what, what the viewers asking is uh, why isn't free why aren't, aren't freemasons who go to church not being a bit more vocal against yeah. fundamentalism yeah, well i think or, or try to convert them or whatever you know what in, into great. being a bit more freer into in, you, you convert them take take them out of their um, fundamentalism is that what you mean yeah, or even visible. I think they go to church, but they don't let anybody know they're Masons. In the Catholic uh, instance, it's obvious, but some of the other churches, I don't know. The thing is, I think within the Protestant churches in America and in and in and in and, in, and I think in Europe as well, some of the more radical Protestant churches are totally against the Freemasonry and see, you know, there's all this nonsense about it being satanic and all this, you know, absolute crap, which has got no, no, no. no um, you know, no bearing whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know where they've actually get that. They've gotten that from, again, uh, mis misinformation, misinterpretation, and, you know, they haven't got a clue what they're talking about. But I think that, um, I don't know, if, you, if you're, um, if, if you're a Baptist, then you go to your, you know, you, you still go to church with your family, but you're a Freemason. Perhaps you don't want to let people know, um, you know, they want to make a big song and dance because it might be uncomfortable for you. Um, but you see, in, it's a good question and it's a relevant question because, of course, in France, uh, and uh, and in Spain, some of these liberal Masonic orders are very vocal, and they will really be criticised in the church openly. And um, in fact, one of the biggest achievements of the Grand Orient de France in France has been to ensure that there's a separation between church and state, laicite as they call it, laicism or secularism. That's been the main, the brunt of their um, whole, you know, objective throughout the, uh, you know, several centuries of existence of this order. So. So it does happen, but I don't think it, it probably doesn't happen so much in English speaking countries because we are all bound to this, um, you know, not to discuss political and topic uh, and religious topics. So we try and keep it separate or anyway. I'm sure. And <clears throat> I'm sure that must be really hard in this day and age. I mean, for, <laughs> for lodges not to talk about trump or brexit you guys must be like pursing your lips because that's what we, everybody we wants talk to about talk it. about we, we can but when we go to the pub uh, or if we you know <laughs> what we can't do is in but again some lodges will do that some of these liberal lodges and that's a question i have for nate if i may um which is um in 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 france and spain most of these liberal masonic orders like the grand Orient of france the grand lodge of italia the grand uh, symbolic lodge of spain they practice the ancient and accepted scottish right and they do something called pieces of architecture or planchas or planches in French, which is um, essays that can be on a wide range of topics. But in some instances, it will, it will be political and, you know, or social and they will all be debating it. And, and for, some, for some of these lodges, that's the main, the main emphasis. The, the ritual isn't so important. You practice the ancient and accepted Scottish right in America. Do you do these things? Do you also have essays and uh, uh, read, or do you do you have these debates in in the open lodge? From my own experience, politics are expressly forbidden in craft masonry. That's yeah. the blue lodges in the Scottish rite, as well as the York rite, as well. So, um, not anything directly religious or political, from my experience. But do you have these? Do you have these sort of debates, maybe about Masonic symbolism? So what we have here, I, I know what you're talking about. We call that a lodge of instruction. And that's oh, when we, in, I'm strictly talking about Massachusetts right now. Um, southern jurisdiction for the Scottish right is a whole other thing versus the Northern and every state has their own types of masonry. Even parts of our state can do things a little, but the idea is that we have lodges of instruction and I've only seen things talking about uh, Roslyn Chapel or, um, different kinds of meetings of our landmarks 
things like that. So nothing uh, political, nothing religious right. uh, that would. You know, so we stay within those within those lines. Yeah, we, we do as well. We do as well in the British Federation of the Drug Commission. It's um, you know the only difference perhaps is that we have women in lodge. But, you know, uh, there's no discussion of uh, social or political issues. But on the European continent and in South America, many lodges uh, practicing the Scottish rights will have these very lively debates in the, uh, in the, in the middle of the meeting, you know, where the, um, the, both columns have to address the uh, brother orator who then, you know, distributes the questions. And, and, it's, um, and it's the main, it's the, you know, sort of like the nuts and bolts of, the, of that Masonic meeting. But, but obviously in, in, in the US and in Massachusetts, the, um, where you uh, work, um, you do your ritual, but you don't have, in the middle of the meeting, there's no debating or any, no. no. Even if it's about uh, Masonic symbolism, I mean. I would love to see that personally. I, I'm more than interested in going and checking that out, but um, it's just not what I've seen here. No, no, no. no. I, I, I think it's a quite common experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, one viewer uh, says that um, where he is in Mexico, it's mandatory that you have to be a Mason to hold office. And there was another oh. question we had as far is it true? All political leaders of all the countries of the world are high level Masons, which I don't think so. <laughs> Ooh, no. no, I think we can safely say we can start with Trump as not a Freemason. He's a no. Norman. He's from the church of Norman Vincent Peel. That's the one. The power That's of right. new thought, but not any sort of free new thought, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's into the new. Th yes, yes. Yeah, that's his. That's his religion, and for better or worse, that's what it is. I think in the nineteenth you know, century and the early twentieth century, many leaders were Freemasons, um, but um, currently, absolutely no. They, 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 I don't think Freemasonry has any bearing whatsoever in international affairs at all. Ha! I found out that George Bush uh, W wanted to take the oath of office on a Masonic Bible, the same one that his father used, the same one that Washington used. And that made people think that he was a Freemason. But far as I can tell, George Bush just wanted to use the Bible because, you know, as we know about him, he really followed in daddy's footsteps. So that was his <laughs> whole thing. Yes, yes. I mean, I think he was um, a member of um, Skull and Bones, but that's a university Correct. thing, isn't it? That's kind of fact. One of these university fraternal societies at university. In that, yeah, yeah, we haven't. Yeah, he was known as temporary. Go ahead, Nate. He was he was known as temporary because he didn't even care enough about it to choose his own name. Uh, that was one of the names given to him, and I think it signifies his own, you know, wishy washiness to do the whole thing. I guess he really didn't care that much about the whole legacy thing. Which um, I don't know. He paints nice pictures though. <laughs> he was just cartilage he wasn't any bones right just yeah. so what would be the last i think tim on mythicism just looking his uh last uh president that was a freemason or famous leader what do you guys know gerald ford was the last president i know of there was a freemason okay what about in europe darren um i really don't know I, I mean there's rumors that in spain um a socialist president um a few years back maybe 10 years back um zapatero i think he th there's rumors saying that he was a freemason but again it's and such so just uh, you know it's it, there's not there's no way behind it and i think that um, it doesn't really matter anyway i mean it would just be an anecdote really and in the uk i don't think any of them have been it's just not fashionable anymore at that level it doesn't have that um it doesn't draw that sort of um attention anymore right right I can and, uh, that margaret Thatcher. <laughs> well margaret thatcher <laughs> yeah uh, who knows if she was she could have she could have perfectly been a member of uh, of a female masonic order i mean there are two 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 very large female masonic orders in the, in the uk who knows i mean there's but two. um Never heard anything. Yeah, there's two, and they're very large. Very, they have loads of lodges everywhere. You know, it's um, and they really um follow all the principles of regularity. You know, to be in um and 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 the United Grand Lodge of England kind of recognises them. You know, I suppose it gets them out of um difficult questioning. Oh no, but they are women Freemasons. Look, see these stories. <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. three hundred. Oh, sorry. Oh no, I wanted to ask you, Darren. Uh... So uh, masonry started out, uh, basically not started out, but when it really, uh, when it when it got its wheel, was a, a deistic pursuit. 
in this day and age is still is it uh, you talk about you have to believe in a higher power is it still a deistic god the great architect or is it more like aa the god of your understanding whoever your god is that you follow personally i think it's the god of your understanding and i think there's loads of people on both on, on all on all different types of freemason who would say that they believe in the supreme being but it's down to them who they, what, what they believe in. So it doesn't have to be a, you know, a religion of the book or a revealed religion or, you know, you don't have, or one of the, you know, the more, the more known and um, common religions. It can be, it, it could be the God of your own understanding. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it in liberal Freemasonry, um, many, many authors accept atheists. That was one of the reasons why the Grand Orient of France in the late 19th century uh, ceased to be recognized by the United Grand Lodge of England because they said, well, we don't need our new members to recognize belief in us, you know, uh, confess belief in a supreme being to join. So atheists could join. Um, so, of course, we have the figure of the grand, ar the great architect of the universe. And I've always wondered how those those fellows, um, you know, negotiate their belief. But of course, they believe in, in an energy or they believe in, you know, chaos magic who knows you know um everybody can have their own beliefs uh, and it doesn't have to be a um a, a, you know a, a religion a religion of the book anymore which i think was the case if we go a few decades back all right, right. and what about uh, you nate uh, would you uh, agree with this or is it any god but abraxas <laughs> well do you want me to tell you the secret no um <laughs> yeah don't show that movie no we're not we're not going to put that movie on <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> now that you've said that okay i'm going to push that tangent away um i want to add before i answer directly that there's a type of freemasonry uh because we we have the continental we have the, the british the american there's also i believe it's scandinavian freemasonry that yes. you specifically you specifically have to be a christian, christian. to be a part yep. of Mm. Yes. So I thought that was worth mentioning because Definitely. it's like the opposite of, um, you know, atheistic. It's like you have to, and it makes me think a lot of Metalocalypse is all I'm going to say. But um, they, <laughs> I'd rather die than go to heaven. <laughs> the atheist church. Yeah, great show. <laughs> I've, got, I've got the coffee. You know, you got to get a cup. But um, so uh, for, for me, um, I'll say that we actually have, uh, different lodges in the state that will keep um, I, at least like three or four uh, different holy books like the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, and the Bhagavad Gita. So um, I happen to know of a brother of ours who recently was initiated into my lodge, which is my mother lodge's Orient Lodge, and he used the Bhagavad Gita. So um, if that kind of illustrates with a practical example of what we're talking about here i think it comes down to your for us as long as you have uh, the supreme architect in the end is basically where we all you know some may even call it source you know what i mean but um it's not pagan it's definitely more towards a monotheistic kind of thing i think that would help flush it out a little more that makes sense. And uh, Vance, uh, any other questions? Or do you have a questions for Darren? Yeah, I've got a good one, which is um, <clears throat> the uh, United States um, founding fathers, many of whom were Masons, seem to have a belief about the sovereignty of the individual and individual rights and so forth. And so um, what's your opinion on, and you know, can answer from your knowledge of Lodroit Humane and the other, you know, traditional masonic uh, brotherhoods of that type of spirit within masonry is it part of it is it something the founding fathers added and here's a second part to the question how does that jive and um nate uh, your your uh, opinion too after after darren would be appreciated how does that jive with socialism where the government is seen to be the seat of all rights and power and so forth in the pure form of socialism and uh what do masons think about that how does masonry uh interact with socialism well i think the going your the first uh, part of your question i think that um the founding fathers um were all very much influenced by the zeitgeist of the period they lived in um you know they um uh, the 18th century, the Enlightenment, the uh, American and French revolutions, um, the completely 
knocking down of the old regime of feudalism. So, um, you know, but from there to um, call them, you know, to, to socialism, there's a big, big step, a big, big stretch. Um, it is true that within liberal Freemasonry, there's um, many orders that um, seem to be openly socialist, um, but um, that doesn't say that doesn't mean that we all are not at all. I mean, and here, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, we do follow the um, the old landmarks of politics and religion, and everybody does what they have to do privately. There's no, you know, nobody will put them on. Um, you know, in Spain, you'll get some Masonic orders who will go out. Um, uh, protesting with all their regalia on, you know, so they're very much on the left. Um, and, I, and I think that's uh, it personally, and, you know, they're probably going to send me some hate mail for saying this, but um, I, th I think that make that's a disservice to Freemasonry. I think that is, um, I think Freemasonry should be, f go far beyond um, politics and religion and not be associated with, with anything directly. A individually, everybody can do what they want, but of course, Freemasonry was uh, born and shaped and moulded during the um, 17th and 18th century. So the values of the Renaissance and the values of humanism and the Enlightenment are always going to be part and parcel of it. Um, and I think always of um, the, um, you know, the, the first recorded initiation in England in 1646, there was probably some before, but the, the first one recorded was um, the initiation of Elias Ashmole, who was a royalist fighting for the king in the English Civil War. And he was initiated alongside um, officers of the, you know, other side, uh, the parliamentarians. And, uh, you know, so politics and religion are, you know, are kept outside. And I think that's what, uh, it, but of course, you can't be a Freemason if you're a, some sort of, uh, you know, neo-Nazi, um, you know, or Stalinist or, you know, totalitarian, you know, free, the spirit of Freemasonry is completely set against any form of totalitarian politics and dictatorship but that's not to say that all freemasons are socialists or that there is um, a direct um, correlation not at all thanks mm -hmm. that's great yeah Nate, what Hitler do you think had to make his own right he had to make his own <laughs> society and his kill off the freemasons yeah. yeah what do you say about this nate uh -huh. well yeah hitler did try to kill the freemasons and um you know, that's uh, um, I think that as far as a political spectrum goes, I think it's worth remembering that anything too far always loops around into the same fascista. Anything too left always loops around and somehow they end up meeting people who are too far right. And I think um, a very public and well-known tenet of masonry is something about being balanced and kind of trying to see things from, you know, like the we have the tree of life. Right. And. Um, I'm using an ex esoteric example where, where not all Masons, just like not all Masons are left or right, not all Masons would even know that uh, the Tree of Life has the pillar of mercy and the pillar of severity. But I think that there's an important idea to say that it's important for me to maintain my freedom, that I'm able to see all of the options in front of me. And if I can see that there's some good here and there's some good here, maybe the ultimate third synthesis, and we're not talking a Hegelian synthesis here, although maybe the Marxists could learn something from what I'm saying, <laughs> and maybe that betrays where I'm coming from a little bit, but I'm a Libra, so I do also have a built-in tendency to be balanced. I would say that you get as many types of men in masonry as there are political flavors, and I, I would definitely say it's very much more tolerant than any organization that would say the authority tells you what to do. So I hope that answers. Um, again, my main message is I find a lot of tolerance and ability to think freely. And that's why I myself, who value balance and value openness and compassion, find so much value in Freemasonry myself. I hope that answers your question. Good, good. Yeah, good answers. And, uh, well, let's get to why Freemasonry, and you deal with this in your book, The Other Brotherhood, Darren, and uh, you, and I think it's a very good argument, uh, you talk about how Freemasonry is very much like the ancient mystery schools, and of course, in ancient times, there were some people who just uh, 
didn't have the appetite or they weren't satisfied with the civic duty sacrifices and sacrifice for the rain and all that. They, they had a thirst for deeper experiences. So they went to the mystery schools for that experience. And of course, uh, as little as we have about the mystery schools is that they lost their fear of death because they really were given sight into higher worlds, into the spiritual world with the gods. And uh, you, as you write, uh, Freemasonry is, takes directly from the mystery schools. Tell us more about this and what you've experienced or why you go. I think Freemasonry is different things for different people. And uh, when people talk about the Masonic secret, um, there's, there's, yes, there's handshakes, there's words for each degree that are secret, but you can find them on the internet, to be honest with you. <laughs> the real secret of Freemasonry is each person's personal individual um, journey and experience of Freemasonry. Um, so, you know, for some, and, and the beautiful thing about Freemasonry is that it's, um, as Nate was saying before, brings people from all different backgrounds possible. So you'll be, you'll have people who go to Freemasonry because they want to meet their friends and have a couple of beers after. Uh, others want to just donate to charity. Others want to, um, others are interested in this esoteric and mystical side of Freemasonry. Others want to use it as a kind of social activist uh, platform, like we said in, you know, in, in, on the European continent. But the, for me personally, I find Freemasonry as being a hair to the um, Western mystery tradition. It's impossible to understand Freemasonry without it. I mean, the ritual of Freemasonry is, um, is it's, um, series of psychodramas uh, where we go through different degrees and we explore i think i'm speaking for myself because i think each each mason will have his, his own or her own view on this but uh, we, we explore the um human condition and we've we, pretty much as in the ancient mysteries you know through uh, shock and awe um you know without going as far as you know we don't get dipped in the sea and you know and <laughs> <laughs> with stuff like that. but you know the, the whole the whole the whole process is to um get us out of the rat race which i think is something i mentioned in the last the, the last time i had the pleasure of being on your show mm -hmm. um you know we spend our life uh, dealing with mortgages excel spreadsheets and uh, job deadlines and you know school runs and you know all this kind of stuff and what masonic ritual does to us is take us out from that and um give us a space where we can breathe and look inside and um pretty much as the, the the western mystery tradition you know and then and, and of course if you, if you know a little bit about uh, magic or theology you can see that there are lots of similarities and of course there's no wonder that um the golden dawn and the oto derived great part of their i would say their rituals but they're uh, the structure of the degree system of freemasonry from freemasonry you know, and those, of course, are orders that are dedicated to, you know, proper occult, occultist orders. The, the beautiful thing about Freemasonry is that you can have, it's a kind of outer order, and you can have all different types of people, people that be very interested and very knowledgeable about, um, uh, you know, esoteric um, matters and, uh, and others who don't, and everybody will get something out of it and contribute something towards it. So, um, but, but I mean, you know, the... Uh, I was talking before to Nate, and um, who's um, recently done his um, 18th degree, I think he was saying, um, in the ancient accepted um, Scottish Rite. I mean, that's a Rosicrucian degree. There's there's loads of um, you know correlations, similarities with um, alchemy and the Rosicrucians. Um, so you know, it's 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 completely you know, as far as I can see, um, part of the Western mystery tradition, without doubt. I wouldn't say it's direct because, of course, you've got. Um, uh, particularly in the 19th, late 19th century, Wade and uh, some of the theosophists, and you know, and who would who would believe that yes, there was a direct linear connection. So, you know, from the Pharaohs and the Gnostics until now, we've all been past past this secret, you know, in a direct transmission. Of course not. I don't believe that. Maybe I'm a bit of a skeptic, but I think that it's um, it's it's uh, it's in the same spirit. Freemasonry is perhaps what's left from all of that. Well said, and you yourself have found, as a reward, have you found a better, you might say, interior life, better connection with higher powers? I mean, that's, you can say that's helped you out? Absolutely. I mean, I was, um, I was what you probably call a nihilist. I was very much into um, Nietzsche, and I had a very um, uh, hedonistic uh, lifestyle uh, to an extreme. Um, so I didn't have any thought or pause for what the um, inner life was. Um, 
what, what the, you know, and, and of course, if we go to to um, organize religion to try and find our in, negotiate our spirituality, it can most of the time fail. Um, there's, there's a lot of dogma. There's a lot of um, you know doctrine and, and 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 things that just don't match up. With Freemasonry, I see it personally as a kind of outer order that's led me into different interests and and you know and guided me into different um, you know occultist and esoteric um, orders. Um, <laughs> morals and dogma. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I did definitely, yes, of course, it's, um, it's, it's helped me, um, you know, and, and this, of course, I, I, I go back to the very trite and known analogy that's used in Freemasonry of the, the rough ashlar and the smooth ashlar. These are stones. So the, the stone that goes, that's been, that's sent to the quarry for the, um, uh, stone masons to polish. That's us before we join the lodge. We, we've got all our doubts and uncertainties and and failings, and we don't really know who we are. And um, when we go through the uh, degrees, the structure of the degrees, um, we we polish that stone and hopefully become a bit more cubic. Which hmm. I don't know if it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good analogy. And what about you, Nate? Uh, outside of uh, world domination and social engineering, and uh, the st yeah, and the stone and singing the stone cutter song, how has uh, Freemason been an experience for you? Have you found an experience, or why do you go? Um, I'll be taking my call from Steve Gutenberg after this, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're, um, yeah, we're showing our age. That's an old show, but it's a classic show. <laughs> oh, Patrick I Stewart. Was, I was, yeah, exactly. I was thinking about um, switching my ringtone to that song, actually. But uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'd have to agree a lot with what Darren said. Um, I find that for myself, um, I am much more into the occult. I mean, occult fan. I'm much more into the esoteric than a lot of um, brethren that I know. Um, there's a myriad of reasons for this, and it's by no means, um, I'm not, I don't mind that. I mean, I what I can get from Freemasonry is that greater sense of self-responsibility, self-respect, and even, um, I guess, uh, self-maturity in a western kind of manner i think um there's other things that i like that i can get other things from but um at the core one of the greatest tools in my tool chest i think is freemasonry are the metaphors and the allegories and even the fellowship that i get from it um i i think that really suffices uh there i could go on and on i mean libra but I really do think that one of the most important things about Freemasonry is the um, almost tribal initiation of you're a man now, it's time to grow up. A lot of tribes got that in different ways back in the day. Yep. And now, you know, part of growing up is realizing that my sex, drugs, and rock and roll hedonistic lifestyle, <laughs> you know, while that makes... You know, well, that makes for a fun night until you realize what you did or said on this, that, or the other thing. That's not serving your community, which has given so much to you. And there's something very sacred I cannot even put into words that is being able to give back. To It's to keep the, you know, in basic esoteric terms, it's keeping the circuit flowing. And that's very important. But I, I mean, at the end of the day, who would you rather be some selfish drunk butthead or would you rather be someone who is moderate and loving and gives to other people? I don't think it takes that much of a, a deep thought, but if you're busy drinking and being selfish, you're not going to consider that. And I think um, that, that I, Miguel, I think, uh, you know, you and I can say that's uh, and, and, and Darren and uh, Vance, uh, everyone. I think that's the way to live is to be caring and compassionate. I'll finish with this. Your three greatest treasures, according to uh, the Buddha or Lao Tzu, are simplicity, patience, and compassion. That's not Masonic specifically, but it's something that I also find in there. Well said. One and out yes. of three is okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Meatloaf well, saying no, two I, out of three is bad. <laughs> No, that's really well said. And I, I think yeah. you hit it also on the head. Uh, 
male and female initiation are extremely important and we sort of lost it in western uh, superficial culture we all have we need those rights and those metaphors to bring us from children to men and so forth to responsible members of the community and when we get lost like darren or even myself we're suddenly adults and we're still we haven't grown up and that's definitely a route to get us back into uh, the flow of life and uh, darren what are, we, uh, what are the universal principles of freemasonry that you write in your book the universal principles of Freemasonry were well, the first thing is to get rid of the electric car, which we've done very well so far. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah, good job. <laughs> and you, you well, almost kept the, 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 the aliens under wraps, but they keep coming out. So you got to work harder <laughs> with that. Yes, these bloody aliens. We'll get them one day. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, if, if we're talking about the universalism of um, Freemasonry, I think, again, I, I go back very quickly to the uh, example I cited before about Elias Asmol. Um, it's inherent to Freemasonry, um, and I think it's a phrase that's in the Constitutions of 1723 or uh, written by Reverend Anderson, who, um, where it says that Freemasonry is there to um, gather that which is scattered, to bring together. I mean, I, and, and, and it's, it's unavoidable, you know, and... And, and I think it's an idea that most people will like, the fact that there's an organization where you, that you can join, if you so desire, regardless of your um, race, ideology, political ideology, religion, social background, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, the, um, so in both regular and liberal uh, Masonic terms, um, Freemasonry is inherently universalist in its aims, I believe. Um, so, so you've, um, and of course, then you have the, uh, it, it spread through the through the British Empire and through European colonialism. Um, and if you read um, Kipling's book Kim, um, Rudyard Kipling, of course, was a prominent Freemason, um, lived in India uh, in, in, during the um, British occupation, and he writes in Kim how the um, local Indian people refer to the, these Masonic lodges that they see in India as the Magic House. They, obviously, there's a word in Indian for that, which I don't know. Uh, um, and then in his, his poem, The Mother Lodge, um, Kipling talks about how he was initiated in this lodge in India in the late 19th century. And one of the members was a Roman Catholic. The other one was a Jew. The other one was a Hindu. The other one was a Muslim. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's uh, that's all there. That's Freemasonry is inherently universalist. I, I don't um, I don't think that there's, there's, there's we can argue with that. Um, but then, of course, what we've got is um, unfortunately, and, and I say this in the book as well, I think that Freemasonry in a way has failed because uh, we've got these two different bands that seem to be on an, on an establishment level, um, you know, polarized and, and separate. So, you know, you've got the United Grand Lodge of England and all the Grand Lodges in the rest of the world are in amity with the United Grand Lodge of England following the principles of regularity. And then on the other hand, you have the liberal Freemasonry in the European continent, but also in South America and with a presence in, in, in English speaking countries as well and in Asia. Um, and then in 1961, 12 Masonic Orders, um, headed by the Grand Orient of France, decided to form an association called CLIPSAS, it's an, in, an international confederation of mas liberal Masonic Orders. Um, and, uh, and they launched the thing, uh, thing called the, um, the Appeal of Strasbourg, which I can, if, if you um, don't mind, I'll just quickly read. Sure. Um, it's very brief, just so we get an idea of what they were. Um, and of course, I think this was another disservice to Freemasonry in a way, but I can understand there's a reaction because they wanted to have their own uh, system of regulating themselves. So the Appeal of Strasbourg states the following principles. To restore the chain of union severed by the unfortunate exclusivity of some orders, contrary to the principles of the Anderson Constitutions of 1723. Of course, regular Freemasons can say, well, we, we are upholding the um, Anderson Constitutions to, to the letter. But anyway, um, it is therefore convenient to start again as a community, considering each and every tradition, rights, symbols and beliefs framed by a respect for the absolute freedom of conscience and to determine the conditions that qualify a Freemason. Work into the glory of the great architect of the universe and request that one of the three great lights is a sacred book. It's something that should be left to each lodge and obedience to decide. To establish fraternal relations and open the doors of the temple to every Freemason, man or woman, who has received the light in a perfect and just lodge on condition that the regulations of the lodge allow this without the requirement of reciprocity. Um, that's Those are the founding principles of CLIPSAS, this international confederation of, of um, 
liberal Masonic orders. There's there's over 70 Masonic orders uh, subscribed. And, you know, I, I find much of what I've just read beautiful. The fact that men, women, atheists, everybody's welcome. It's universalism again. But of course, we've still got this distance with um, the root of Freemasonry, which is regular Freemasonry um, in, you know, Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry. Mm. What's received the light? That fascinated me. I heard that and my ears went up. Yes, what it's... Yes, it's, it's 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 very very beautiful, um, and um, the eclipse has um, it stands for because I um, it's a bit of a mouthful. The center of liaison and information of Masonic powers signatories of the Strasbourg Appeal, and of course, what I've just read was part of this the Strasbourg Appeal, um, which I think is is beautiful, and I subscribe to it all. Really, um, you know, I I just think it's very nice. So the light is the body of the organization or the board of directors or the, the well, in, what, what is that in, in, that? in Masonic terms, light is uh, so many different things. Um, I suppose it's um, Masonic light, which is the, um, yes, initiation, Masonic initiation. So in that context, receiving the light is being initiated. I see. Yeah, great. By the way, um, I had a question from the uh, from a viewer here, which about, and this is something that a friend of mine who is a Shriner actually, and it's kind of like has retired from all that, uh, kind of corroborated this. Um, uh, this uh, um, uh, this viewer wants to know if Masonry, I don't see uh, Ladroit Humane doing this as much as maybe the mainstream lodges, but pulls you in a little bit more, and gets you involved and in doing more and more things more ceremonies then you gotta uh, do duty in the lodge fix it up or do whatever uh, i know um you know they you have to serve as lodge master when you get to a certain you know they rotate lodge masters out every once in a while so there's a lot of work and a lot of time that's consumed in uh, being a mason and then uh, the viewer said after a few years you're donating thousands although that's not my uh, my friend's experience but uh what do you guys have to say about that because uh, people would be interested in knowing if they want to be a Mason, whether or not they're going to have to commit a lot of their time and or money. Well, um, I'll start, I'm, I'm sure Nate's got something to say. Uh, if I, I start, if I may, uh, I've just, uh, donate, um, you know, um, <laughs> one can only donate within its, its post possibility. So, you know, there's never any obligation to donate, um, you know, and, and I should know. I mean, I'm certainly no um, Rockefeller, I can tell you that quite the opposite um so you know but but of course you, if you've got um somebody that's uh you know it's got a businessman a very wealthy businessman well yes i'm sure he'll probably donate the check with lots of um zeros and knots at the end but um um you know there's people that just put five dollars in you know in, in the box it's it's not it's you just you you give as according to what your possibilities are and that's actually said to you in the in the ritual when you're uh, initiated you're actually told that you're not expected to give more anything that's going to be detrimental to yourself or to your family and in, and it's the same with time you know time is money isn't it 21st century so so uh, you give what you can in terms of time and money and and, and there's no obligation um, to go beyond that because it would be it could be self-destructive couldn't it what about you nate or did we catch you uh doing something naughty i don't even know what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> I'm plugging my ritual. <laughs> I'm plugging my phone in. Actually, uh, oh, I got yeah. the little ding ding that it running out of battery. Um, I don't know. Maybe the archons find my running out of energy naughty. But anyways, yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, we don't even have to go. I I would love to go down uh, on a further conversation about a lot of that. Um, I'd like to quickly jump back before I talk about the um question that uh, the uh the viewer brought up about sure. uh, the donation of resources um this does remind me by the by um i have a big thing for tools holy gift and for twin peaks so i'm gonna of course bring this together uh twin peaks has the bookhouse Bo bookhouse boys are in twin peaks and if anyone's read david lynch's um uh, excuse me mark frost's uh the secret history of twin peaks Freemasonry plays a large role in that. In fact, there's a fold-out page of a Masonic apron. 
And uh, I'd like to just say that the Twin, uh, Twin Peaks' bookhouse boys that David Lynch uh, had, I because he was a Boy Scout um, that he has in there, I think that bookhouse boys are supposed to represent the Freemasons. And I I don't say that uh, uh, making a reach or anything like that. I, I th- with, with careful, studied um, understanding of the series, that's, that's in there. So I, I would like to add that this is going back to saying they are a very good organization. And um, Darren, you said something about, I took notes from your book. Um, you were mentioning about um, the, uh, to, to reach further and gather what is scattered, right? Those are the two main. Um, and of course, the tool holy gift thing comes into this because, oh, there it is, because tool talks about in the Grammy Award winning song, Schism, They say, you know, talking about the temple toppling over and we need to bring the pieces back together again to rediscover communion or communication. And this is all hidden within. This is we're living out the story right now. Like this is it gets very meta very quickly. So to bring it very down to earth, um, as far as resources go, you're you're only expected to do what you can do. We're all humans as Masons. So if you have, um, if you have this amount of time, you know, it's like we can tell who's who. And if you're doing your end of the bargain and it's nothing exorbitant, there's, I can understand the, the viewer maybe, you know, cause before I was a Mason, it was like, Oh, well, what's this? What's this? To answer your question as directly as possible you're not going to be expected to give anything that you can't give. And it's very compassionate and understanding as to what you can. A lot of people who have a lot will give a lot more. If you don't have a lot, it's very deeply appreciated when you show up and help with the blood drive with a membership um, fundraiser to help a sick and distressed brother. You know, um, we do a lot for um, the brothers wives who have, uh, you know, for the brothers who have departed from us, like um, I'll, I'll finish by saying, like, I was busy, but I was able to give about two hours of my time to go out and spend about two hours with a widow this um, Christmas. And it was she it meant the world to her. So, I mean, like things like that. It's not like donating like your car or whatever. You know, I, it's not like that. It's about doing the things that you could think of. That would you would want people to do for you if you were laid up or if you had your grandmother who was all alone, it's things like that. I hope that answers the question better. Yeah, I think that gives people a feel. Certainly did for me. By the way, is your place on fire? I see smoke going across. The <laughs> so do I. I think he's, he's vaping. <laughs> ah. well, I have two. I have two responses. A lot of people say I tend to have a hot mic, so. Um, oh, no. <laughs> So, um, and, uh, you know, you do see my, like I said earlier, um, my occult fan sigil logo thing is the arc fire of the covenant, the electric fire, but oh, basically it's just, okay. it's because I look so smoking hot in this tux, baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah very good. Oh, brother. Yes. <laughs> the puns events are, you're getting beaten to the pun. So, uh, and for the record, I am not a Freemason. I was initiated as a Martinist a long time ago, but. I never had an experience, so I didn't last long there. Decided to go other pursuits, uh, more shamanistic pursuits. And you, Vance, I believe you're not a Mason, but weren't you a Rosicrucian once upon yeah. a time? Or did I just, are they going to kill you now because I just no, exposed no, that's you? No, okay. It's, uh, I'm, I'm far enough away from San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, they say you're never, once they accept you, you're always a brother, even if you're inactive. But the Rosicrucians, kind of a mail order uh, brotherhood, so to speak, and um, I don't remember what they uh, if they admit women, but um, the the I'll I'll try. This is a very interesting story. So I was in my twenties, and the uh, national headquarters of AMORC is in San Jose. They have the Egyptian Museum. I highly re- recommend it. And they have a Martinus Church on the same site. It's a big site. So I went. I joined. Um, yeah, they accepted me, and I did the monographs every week and so forth. And part of it was a meditation. So they would, uh, you'd read the magazine, and then every month uh, they'd have a different topic. And you'd go and you'd meditate and uh, concentrate on this intention that the brotherhood would want to 
have happened. During one of those meditations, I got a huge message that there was something very corrupt within the order that was trying to take advantage of the power of the brotherhood for its own ends. And it freaked me out so much that I just put it wow. all away. Now, years later, I was at a party, a singles event party. Um, and um, I met this gal, who I won't mention her name because she's kind of high up in the, in the Rosicrucians now, I believe. Um, and I told her about my experience. I said, oh, yeah, well, this is what was happening during that time because it was a few years, you know, like five years afterwards. And uh, I don't know if anybody's followed the history of the Rosicrucians through the 80s, whatever. It was a big shakeup. And there was a big fight for who was going to control the order. And there's this one imperator that supposedly embezzled the money, but he controlled. It, it was a big mess. So apparently I had signed of during one of these meditations inadvertently come across this situation in the energy of the place. So that was interesting. Years later, I went back and contacted this gal because I remembered her name and she didn't really say, oh, I don't remember you. I don't remember anything about it. Blah, 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 blah. But she was pretty high up. She wasn't the imperator, but she was high up in the administration. So, um, you know, heavy on uh, definitely occult things, uh, paranormal things, um, alchemy. There's a lot of things that they cover, even in the early monographs. So I only made a couple of initiations. Uh, I did get to the dweller on the threshold. That was scary. Very scary. Wow. Could I well, something? That'd be all right? Yeah, yeah, um, please that, do. Yeah, sure. Well, to your point, I, I as I mentioned earlier, um, and I'll, I'm glad, I'm fine to mention it now. Um, I myself am looking into joining uh, the Rosicrucians, and I'll be taking the first degree. Uh, you know, all going all going accordingly. I'll be taking the first degree in I think April, and uh, you really you're kind of lighting my fire here to keep a bad pun going, but. Um, <laughs> Well, oh, don't um, worry, don't, don't bother. Just send Vance ten grand. He'll initiate you himself, <laughs> right? <laughs> See, people are worried about the Masons, and it's Aeon Bite that's actually okay. Anyways, <laughs> so here's here's what um they do uh, uh the two things you need to be initiated as a Martinist. I found out to join um the Rosicrucians. So that's one thing I think is worth mentioning. Oh, then I'd and be in. <laughs> You're Not at the time see. that I was there, unless there's two kinds of flavors of it, because one of the things I didn't like about it is they drag you on. If you want to progress faster, if you'd like want to study faster, no, they regulate you week by week by week. And it takes years to get anywhere that way. I went to a lodge celebration one time and it was like a funeral. I was hoping to meet people and talk to people. Nobody would talk to me. They're all like really, really, you know compared to me in my 20s, old people, and they had no interest in me. Uh, there's actually a little community in San Jose. All the houses around the uh, complex are many of them or most of them, if not all of them, are owned by Rosicrucians. But I found that there was no physical brotherhood there. It was all by the mail. And actually, this gal that I told you about says, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the joke. There's a secret order. There's a real order that you, know, that you get into, and this whole thing is just to make money. The, the monographs and so forth. I don't know if that's strictly true, but it certainly rang true with me that there must be more than this. There must be more vibrancy to Rosicrucians than this. So be careful. Don't I'm, like ta I'm taking your advice, right? I'm consider I will continue to. Uh, that's dark, to say the least. Um, I, they, they do allow women. Um, in fact, the lodge, uh, oh, I attended yeah. an, an open lodge session and there was a lot of, um, there was white people, black people, men, women. It was really diverse. And um, I thought that was, uh, that was very cool. And uh, it's the lodge I'm talking about is the Johannes Kelpius Lodge in Boston. So, um, you know, I don't know if they're going to regulate it or not. I don't know how much patience I'll have, but I do try to be patient. So I don't know. That's, uh, that's definitely, you're, it's very striking commentary, Vance. Well, it's, it's true, but it's true the Rosicrucians of the 70s. Like I said, there's some sort of revolution. Who knows what happened after that? I didn't follow it, so take it for what it's worth. Yeah, interesting. Well, I think, uh, again, you don't have to give Vance 10 grand, but I'm sure if you have any questions, he can guide you. <laughs> He's got his own Rosicrucian bullshit detector. But 
I'm while we're on. Yeah, while we're on the subject of sensationalism and everything for Darren and then maybe Nate, why do you think the whole uh, sensationalism of Freemason, even if the numbers are down, even if there's less world leaders who are Freemason, it still seems to be under a lot of juice and power, the idea of Freemason world conquering, you know, the whole thing. And I mean, even here on Aeon Byte and Nate and Vance were here in a lot of these interviews, we've had some guests who are very educated, very cogent, very sober, great people, but they have their research still shows them that Freemasons are still sort of the the Illuminati, the 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 man behind the curtain, the architect of the matrix. Uh, why do you think this continues to persist, uh, Darren? It's nonsense because I, I, nobody's given me a golden handshake. You know <laughs> or I mean? a mansion, yeah. or an airplane, or a yeah, harem nothing. of beautiful yeah. women. No. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, none of that. No, I, I think this is, um, again, it's misguided. I think the media uh, blow it up. And I think that, you know, during the 18th century and the 19th century, um, yes, it was, you know, Freemasonry was, an, was always close to the events. I mean, I don't think that Freemasonry was, um, you know, what was important in the 18th century was the Enlightenment, the philosophy of the Enlightenment and what that did and how that led to revolutions and complete change of political and social structure. But Freemasonry was the kind of gel that bonded it all together in a way. It was a, it was a conduit. Um, and yes, there was very influential people that were Freemasons and even up to the first half of the 20th century. But, um, you know, I think it's because we live in a positivist and, uh, you know, scientific you know mad positivist society completely materialistic where people would think why would people go and put an apron on do funny handshakes use an archaic language of the 18th century um and join in these lodges what are they doing you know well they must be about money or, or, or orgies or something like that you know so they're always going to be they, they, there's always the presumption that there's going to be something um for gain um i think um uh, because you know why would people do that people you know we Everything's so utilitarian nowadays. Everybody does something for for a particular reason. For and normally that reason is either you know um, losing weight, getting fit, <laughs> making money, uh, progressing in your career, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So so people don't seem to understand. I think um, people I think think that you know it's it's a little bit ex it's beyond eccentric. So there must be a material reason for Freemasons to um, to do what they do. And of course this is compounded by the fact that we've had people like. Um, the Leo Daxil, um, you know, um, the scams he did, yeah. scam and Agustin Baruel and certain people that throughout the history have maligned, purposely maligned um, Freemasonry for political or material gain. So I think it's uh, unfortunately the, the, the product of ignorance um, that people think that, you know, people don't really know and they are making assumptions and, and I think they're wrong. Yeah, it seems to, uh, again, it doesn't seem to be dying even, uh, I mean, you can go from Jack T. Chick to so many other writers, it's still the Freemasons are behind this and that, the creation of Israel, World War II, I mean, and it keeps going on and on. So tell us exactly what you think, Nate, since you were, you've been, uh, you've been present for these. <laughs> Such a great desire to respond with jokes and things like that but i think i do more of a service if i just take a sober uh stance and just say part of it is tribalism it's the fear of the other um everything can be kind of summed up with ignorance and fear um and i think that's one of the things that ironically if otherwise you know as a freemason uh as someone who seeks uh to be enlightened to live in truth and to be as, uh, dare I even say, Christ-like as or full of gnosis as I can be, um, I find that the exact issue is that people who are seeking to live or who aren't necessarily seeking to live but are coming from a place of ignorance, guilt, fear, and shame will tend to project that Jungian shadow aspect and people can get what I'm saying right now. It's your filter of reality is what you're going to filter all of the sensory input as. So it's exactly that. You can manifest it in a sociological manner by saying it's tribalism or the 
quote unquote alien. You could say that it's, um, you know, just fear of someone who has something that in your own self that you desire, but because of complexes, you might not be ready to approach yet. Um, I think there's a myriad way of saying it, but ultimately it comes down to fear, guilt, ignorance, shame, and all of those other quote unquote sins. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you uh, continually uh, externalize your own personal power, you're going to live that way for the rest of your life. I would encourage anyone hearing this to know that you are inherently worthy and valuable of love, of good experiences, of giving yourself a shot at learning, even if it's hard, even if those things that you find aren't what was comfortable. The reason you're at where you're at is because you've kept doing what was comfortable. And I hope that's a good enough answer for now. No, it's a good one. And But what about you, Darren? Do you see any times in history where the Masons were that influential that they could shift geopolitical events, as far as you know? And I mean, I'm not saying nefarious purposes. I'm saying they had an impact. Not as a mon not not as a monolith, a monolith. Not no way. Not not a, you know individuals that, that happened to be Freemasons. But um, let's look at the French uh, Revolution. You had people like Mirabeau or Lafayette. Lafayette um, fought in um, with the Americans against the British in the American Revolution. Um, and when he went to France, returned to France, he was part of the um, French Revolution. But he wanted to keep the um, the king. He, he thought the monarchy still had a, a role to play. You, and he was a Freemason, so was Mirabeau. Uh, I'm pronouncing it terribly, by the way, but anyway. Um, and then you've got Danton and Robespierre, who were um, also Freemasons. They didn't want any, they wanted um, a republic, a staunch republic, and that's it. Um, and then you had loads of Freemasons who were uh, part of the nobility, who wanted no revolution whatsoever. So, it, no, I don't think that Freemasonry has ever been... I think that it was, it was fashionable. And I think if it harks, harks back to um, ancient times. We go back to the Western Mysteries, where um, the, the, the ancient mysteries of Eleusis or um, Mitras, they were um, accepted and respected. They were, they, they were, you know, acceptable. They were not frowned upon, you know. I mean, Ulysses, I mean, there was thousands of people going through those initiations at once, weren't they? So there was space in society to have these things and not be branded as a nutcase. As we've become more rationalistic and more, um, you know, and, and, and since the 20th century and this this paradigm of uh, positivism, we um, there's no space for any of that. So Freemasonry is always going to look like something odd and weird hmm. because it doesn't fit. Well, what are these guys doing with aprons? Why are they wearing aprons, for Christ's sakes? What's all this funny handshake? What's all these words? What's all these um, symbols? So, you know, and they, and they wear tuxedos in interviews and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> We have some questions about well, that. Well, that's class. That's class. Yeah, yeah, in, that's in, it. In video Stylish. Room. Stylish. Well, didn't it, true? Um, in fact, my friend that was a Shriner, is a Shriner, I suppose, still, he says that uh, years ago, uh, people at lodge meetings were required to dress formally. They'd come like that. I mean, it's not for a long, long time. But uh, now, you know, but they have to dress up and appear nicely and so forth. So that, that's, that's uh, I think that's a standard throughout the whole of Freemasonry. Um you know, maybe we're not, we don't, you know, look like um, as, uh, you know, dapper as our friend Nate here, but um, <laughs> people will be wearing suits and ties. Uh, women will be wearing um, white right. and black dresses. Yeah, there's a standard right. because if not, um, you know, it, it, you know, imagine we're using a, a beautiful 18th or 17th century ritual. We've got these beautiful columns. We've got the candles lit and we're saying these wonderful words and we're dressed in tracksuit bottoms. It doesn't really, <laughs> it doesn't go with it, does it? So, so, but, but it's, that's what it is really, I suppose to just, um, it's an aesthetic, um, part of the aesthetics really. Yeah. yeah. And for the, uh, for the audience, uh, who will be getting this audio version on iTunes? We're talking, uh, one of our members, Nate is wearing a tuxedo for the thing. And so that's why we're saying that, uh, Vance has his flashing Illuminati things in his background. So it's always fun on video. Wow. There you go. 30 second. So that's why we're saying this. And it's interesting, interesting to what you say, Darren, because yes, in the American revolution, you had American and British generals firing at each other who were both Freemasons. And Correct. in the mystery religions, it accepted poor, it accepted the emperors, 
I'm sure there were sworn enemies who would show up to the mystery religions to get that experience. So, as you say, it probably wasn't uh, it wasn't monolithic. Definitely, um, individuals did different things, you know. And then, um, of course, at some point, um, Freemasonry m must have been. Well, ha I'm sure it has been misused for political purposes. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the, the, the famous uh, Lodge of the Nine Sisters, uh, where Benjamin Franklin was a member, and um, so was Voltaire, and um, so was, um, I think, Camille de Moulins, who was one of the French revolutionaries. They're all members. And I'm sure that things were discussed, um, you know, using that membership. But again, that's just incidental. Um, many Freemasons ended up in the guillotine. Some became rich and some had to escape. Um, so, you know, using the French Revolution as an example. So I don't really think, and, and of course, and with the British Empire in the 19th century, Freemasonry did trouble. And of course, I'm sure Nate, you've, you've seen the um, uh, the man who would be king, uh, the film. You've probably, you've, with Michael Caine and Sean Connery, where, you know, and, and based on uh, Rudyard Kipling's um, short story. Um, and in a way, uh, the, the through the British Empire, uh, Freemasonry was was spread, but uh, again, I don't think it was it wasn't part of that colonial mentality or ideology. It was just something that happened, and lots of the uh, natives um, of these countries that were colon being colonised um, joined and loved Freemasonry. And I mean, you know, in India, the Grand Lodge of India is God, it's huge, it's massive, I'm told, um, in terms of membership, and you know, it's very very prominent. Could I make a point too about um, just the general nature? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I say this strictly as an individual. This isn't um, representative of any group that I'm part of or will be a part of. But uh, I'm just gonna speak from my own gnosis. Uh, it seems that there are some strange kind of dreamlike logics that run our reality, and um, this could be um, the way that our matrix works. But like, for example, people tend to point at FDR being a 32nd degree Freemason or um, true and being the 32nd president and then Truman being a 33rd degree Mason and being, you know, the 33rd president and also all of the history that came with them. I would say that our reality runs off of some strange synchronicity engine. I'm a third generation at least. And I mean, at least it's probably further back. Uh, allow me the quick interlude to explain that for my own synchronicities, um, my grandfather, who is um, up here, uh, he was 33 when he joined. My father was 69 when he joined. I was 33 when I joined. Uh, I was explaining to Darren that, of course, you can add that up to 666. And we're talking about an organization that has, and again, this is just me explaining synchronicities, uh, we're talking about an organization that has a chief feature of Solomon in the game from whence I got a cult fan from Final Fantasy VIII. There's an item called Solomon's Ring that requires 666 items. So you can see that this goes way above human functioning. That's three generations of people. All right. I find it extremely extravagant and indulgent to believe that someone was planning for my grandfather and grandmother to then have my father, who was waiting until he was almost 70, to fulfill this kind of chain of events. So when you hear 32nd degree Freemason as 32nd president and 33rd is 33rd, I want you to remember that you might either be really reading too far into things or there's a machination far above humans. And since you're a human, don't go blaming other humans. <laughs> well said, and well said. Great architect doing all this. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, TV screens. <laughs> all glory and praise to the grand architect in any, in any event or case. Yeah, that's the G uh, in the Masonic symbol, right? That stands for the Grand Architect. And geometry. Ah. Uh, a lot of people also say Gnosis as well. So I've heard that too. Once again, Miguel's uh, apparently... Uh, everyone just admit it. Miguel is the puppet master. 
<laughs> worst puppet master in the world has got the strings tied all over me yeah that's yes exactly i am i am the reason for the electric car or the suppression of the electric car i think that's that's the joke today but what about Great this job, i mean Max. yeah my theory has always been this and uh, i follow again i will mention chris hayes the twilight of the elite i mean <laughs> excuse me when you have an issue it's not a catholic issue it's not a jewish issue it's not a freemason issue or a republic or a democrat would have or penn state football team or whatever the, the problem is twofold like uh, with vance their humans are corruptible they will be corruptive at any level and you're gonna have issues with the rosicrucians freemasons i mean i've i've been to aa meetings where somebody's stealing money it just happens it's human nature the other two is a question of the elite you have people at the top who have uh, access to the funds, to the connections, to the all that. They're going to make the really self-serving bad decisions in a lot of places. And again, it doesn't matter top of, uh, you know, a Protestant church or a Protestant movement or whatever. Would you agree with that, Darren? I mean, I, th I think it's an elite problem and not a Freemason, Jewish, Gnostic or whatever boogeyman you want to have today. Scapegoat. I mean, this is it's, it's about scapegoating, isn't it? Really, and that's what it, you know. And and, and um, uh, so long as Freemasonry has been a very secretive organization, um, it's been scapegoated because. And and you know, we were talking before the interview how there was this witch hunt in the UK with Tony Blair's government in the late nineties, um, and as a consequence, what um, the United Knowledge of England has done is initiate the process of openness. They've they've revamped their website and their um, everything's completely transparent and open, so that anybody can go and see the, you know, you can actually go on a tour of the Grand Lodge, without being a Freemason and go inside the Grand Temple and you can see everything and you can see that it's there's absolutely nothing to hide, um, and of course it's uh, it's about the elite on one hand. And the elite will do whatever has to, you know, if, if it was convenient to be a Freemason 300 years ago, well, let's be a Freemason because then I can get to that guy and yeah, 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 it's, it's all very nice, all this nice ritual and all that. Let's see what, how, let's see what we, can, um, we can do over there in, um, I don't know, in China, wherever we are, that we're putting our hands in. Yeah, start an opium war or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Churchill you know, was, uh, I think uh, Winston Churchill did his first degree and then he didn't progress it. And, you know, he probably thought, well, I don't need to go anymore. Now I'm prime minister. Exactly. You know, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah. yeah. I know LBJ took his first degree, but uh, full disclosure, I do not like LBJ. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who does anymore. But yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I just saw Inception well, it's like, last where, night. Where was George Bush? Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Inception, great film. Yeah, and you know what? I bring it up because uh, we've been saying, well, is it the Masons who are controlling the world or the Rosicrucians are controlling the world or the Bilderbergers or the Illuminati, which was mentioned by a viewer, by the way, and wants to know if they infiltrated the Masons. But, uh, Miguel, I go with you. There's uh, There are certain inherent archetypes of power, and they're related to money. They're related to pol politics. Uh, especially and so these groups the, and, and any particular masonic lodge a rosicrucian lodge just in, like in my case they are they are susceptible to having ideas implanted in them and harnessed as a group if they're not careful and so maybe this is a better model that the elite use the groups not the groups are the elite not always i'm saying and most of the people in these groups aren't going to be part of it they're just maybe going to be contributing at low levels with their resources to keep the thing going some money from more uh you know wealthy people but it's the structure and this is what we're about in gnosis right trying to figure out what the nature of the demiurge is where how he controls the world if it's a he if it's an it if it's nothing if it's an archetype so the big question is who's messing this world up and who created the world so that everybody eats each other uh and so you know maybe we're being inceptionized all the time you know <laughs> as well said yes i mean in scientology i know a lot of people have benefited from scientology that i've known it's helped them with a lot of problems but then again you get to that top level you get a david miscavige or a, you know l ron hubbard and that's when things go wrong so it continues. I, I'm, I'm with you guys. And yeah, in the chat room, there's somebody, there's Yaldabaoth. I'm getting kind of scared with that there, Nate. Who is this Yaldabaoth haunting us? 
he's finally caught up with us. Yes, yeah, he's here. The demiurge is bringing down the hammer. So very interesting. Yeah. And uh, to for a sense of transparency, you ha at the end of your book, uh, Darren, you have a group of you have uh, sections on rituals. Tell the audience about that. Uh, well, it's, it, I don't go into um, any details as to how the, uh, the ritual workings um, uh, develop, but um, you know, there's there's a number of um, rituals that are used by different um, Masonic orders. So. A very common one in the um, states is the ancient and accepted Scottish rites, which is the uh, the one that I think most of us know or most people know about, which is you know from the first degree to the thirty third degree. Um, then you have the um, emulation ritual in in England, which is um, a very old and very subtle uh, ritual, which we do watch the the first three degrees, and then there's a number of side orders after that. Um, the British Federation have their own unique, of the, the Drachumane have their own unique um, rituals, which are the Lord of the Old Ritual, which was based on an, a ritual originally called the Dharma ritual. And you can see the, theos the theosophical um, influences there. Um, and, um, you know, so, so uh, it's, it's, it's what, something that strikes me is that the many liberal Masonic orders in France and Spain, they, they will use the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, which is um, there's, there are lots of uh, knights. It's very chivalric, and uh, there are lots of knighthood type names, you know, knight of this, knight of that. So they're very, um, and and yet they, um, they, you know, many of them are a very uh, people that practice it that are, are very um, against sort of um, the ideal of power. They're sort of very on the left and very, you know. So so it's quite 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 funny that, but um, th there's such a large variety of rituals that it's just um, impossible. At the, at the end of the book, I also have a a series of interviews with different um, Freemasons, mm -hmm. which I think I think that's also quite good in terms of transparency because um, it's you know you've got uh, of course there's, uh, there's I interview um, I'm very likely to be uh, to interview Julian Rees, who's a very famous and celebrated Masonic author, um, and Javier Otaola, who's a, a very famous. Uh, he was the president of Clipsas um, in 1999, and um, he was the Grand Master of the Grand Symbolic Lodge of Spain, and, and he's an author. Um, writes all sort of uh, fantastic books, um, but then I've also I've also interviewed them um, uh, Philippe Boudouin, who's a member of the Grand Orient of France, um, and um, uh, Lorena, who's a sister in in the Spanish Federation of the Drac Humane. So, you know, just so the reader can get a flavour of how you know we're all just uh, individuals. There's no um, machinations to um, stop the electric car. <laughs> yeah, but we. You, you did make Steve Gutenberg a star, so that's the <laughs> sin I don't think you could be forgiven for. That's one reason to persecute all Freemasons. But uh, uh, Hitler so, went after us. Hmm. I said, "Is that why Hitler went after us?" Yes, because he saw that Steve Gutenberg yeah, was going to be famous in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, curious, Darren, if, is La Droid Humane only in Europe, or can any gringos become one here in the of United States? Of course, you have your own. You have your own American Federation of uh, La Droid Humane. Oh, okay. So there's a number. I don't know. I can't remember now how many lodges, but there's a large number. Of, well, it's a fair, fair amount of lodges in in the United States. I think in Canada as well, um, in South America. So I think you also have lodges of the uh, Grand Orient de France and the Grand Lodge de France and many, many others. Um, there, there are so many uh, Masonic orders in the world. It's just, well, we would spend all night here listing them. Right. And uh, what do you I, think? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, and of course, once you, um, I'm a member of Le Drac Humain, so I can visit any lodges from Grand Orient de France, the Grand Symbolic Lodge, the Grand Lodge d'Italia, you know, any any Masonic um, uh, liberal Masonic um, lodge that I wish. Oh, wonderful! And why do you think uh, do you, Freemasonry, as you were talking, we were talking before the interview, has is losing as numbers? Uh, do you see this continuing? Do you think it needs to be reformed, or what is your views on this, Darren? Um, I think. Uh, and I say this in the book, based on a book by two French Freemasons um, who who did the uh, put, put some figures together, which I I won't bore you with. But um, I think that regular Freemasonry is declining. Um, members are aging, um, but you know the United Lodge of England has done a, a, a really big campaign to recruit younger people. Recruit is the wrong word, but you know to say to attract 
younger people into their um, ranks. But um, what I still hear is that the numbers are declining and lodges are closing. Uh, there's there's loads of uh, there are many lodges that are closing on a weekly basis because they they just don't have the numbers. The uh, the members of uh, aged and no new people have come in to replace them. I think that um, it can be a bit too parochial. It can be a little bit too, um, um, you know, devoid of this esoteric and spiritual content. And I think that's because I think that uh, many Masonic establishments don't want to, um, they, they want, they shy away from this esoteric and spiritual side of things. They don't really want to be associated in any way to the Western Mystery tradition or anything that's uh, remotely, you know, linked to occult, to the occult. Um, but on the other hand, for example, smaller orders like, the, you know, for example, the British Federation here is, you know, it is numbers are growing, you know, slowly but steadily. Mm -hmm. And it's the same. And as I say, in France, for example, the Grand Orient of France is um, the largest um, order there. So um, but but of course, I think that it's, you know, we are seen as being a bit fuddy daddy, aren't we? And a bit um, <laughs> stuffy, I think, by a lot of people. That's the unfortunate thing. And, and it's a it's a matter of us trying to communicate what really you know what really goes on without giving away the secrets you know which, which would just reduce the impact of the ceremonies but um it is a wonderful thing yeah wonderful wonderful and as we get closer to the end of the interview where can people find out more about you do you have a web page i know we we you and i usually hang out on facebook so yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i, I um, people can go on the um website of my uh, the publisher of my la uh, last book falcon books publishing which is um <laughs> Very interesting. There's a number of books on hermetic, on the hermetic tradition, as understood by Franz Bardon. So you have people like Martin Fawkes writing there, and um, Julian Rees, I think, will um, be publishing his books as well. So Falcon Books Publishing. There's a section of interviews, and um, I, I can be found there, and my book as well. All right, wonderful, and yeah, it's it's a good read, audience. I enjoyed it. A good snapshot of uh, Ledroit Humane, the history of Freemasonry. Again, you're not going to find any aliens or electric cars or anything like that. It's just a good sober history of Freemasonry in this. But yes, I'm sorry, but uh, good book, and I enjoyed it. So, Darren, I want to thank you very much for once again coming on AM Bite or a subdivision called Heretics Anonymous and uh, sharing your, your wonderful ideas and thoughts and your new work. Thank you very much, Miele. It's, always, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Pleasure is all ours. And uh, Nate, thanks for uh, joining us for this uh, celebration of Freemasonry and smoke and nice, nice clothes and all that, man. You, you rock. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for once again inviting me on. And uh, Vance, it's uh, great to be around uh, with you too. I'll add a, a strange little synchronicity. When my brother was a child, he had a pet hamster. And uh, what are the two things you call Vance? You, 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 here we go. You call him the moon dog right. and, the ch and the chicken wing man. Right. My brother's hamster was named chicken dog. <laughs> and the metaphor of Vance on the wheel of karma going around. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm back in my wheel now. <laughs> he can never escape <laughs> the clutches the of the, of, the game of Saturn. The game of Saturn, yeah. The Thank game you of so Saturn. much. Uh, and you, you, uh, you really rock, man. I, I really enjoy, uh, really enjoy talking with you, and I look forward to. Uh, doing so again so cheers oh, yes. and, uh, we, we shall well, continue boy. well thank you Vince, for being here as well thanks oh, for uh, it's my pleasure hey uh before the uh before the taping here or the the broadcast we agreed to prank darren by putting a picture of gomez adams up but nobody laughed yet so here it is <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite actors is raul julia one of my favorite oh, he, yeah. he and, yeah and he he passed away way too early he, but he was yes, a brilliant actor so so, and of course, uh, we will have to say goodbye to the audience. Thanks for the great questions and all the conspiracies and all that good stuff there. I see your Lawrence Galian and some of the others. Uh, great comments. Yeah, there's a lot of good information. People talking in the chat section about yeah. Masons and different orders and was Crowley and all that. So good Sorry stuff. We and we should. Yeah, yeah. We'll hopefully yeah. next time. And but yeah, good resources. Thanks everybody for being here at Heretics Anonymous. And everybody, thanks and have a good Sunday. You too. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Cheers. Bye bye.